I want to start out this morning with our time in God's Word in a little different way. I want to play a game. And this is, I'm serious, if you don't play along, it's going to be very boring and you're going to have to wait a while. When are the eagles coming on? How long can, how long can I stall? <laughs> I want to play a little game here. I know you've probably all done this or heard this before, but we're serious here, okay? Pretend you're trapped on a desert island. Gilligan may or may not be there. I don't, that's just depending on when you grew up and what's in your head. You're trapped on a desert island. And somehow, it does not have to make sense at this point, you can have one item with you. What would it be? The first answer I got this morning was a hunting knife. That was fairly disturbing. <laughs> Whatever. You're trapped on a desert island. One item. What's it going to be? Go ahead, shout it out. You. Aww. <laughs> That's rigged. <laughs> Cell phone. What would you take? Your family. All right. Go ahead. A soccer ball. I like that. I, I told the folks this morning, they were coming up with answers. I said, you know, this would sound really different if we had some youth and kids. And I like it. Family, soccer ball, what else? Just shout it out. Laptop. The first, first service this morning, it was not thinking electronics. I can tell you that. I heard laptop, what else? Bible. Did you have one there? Joseph's trying to tell me something. You're going to take your schoolwork. Man, you're teaching them right there. Woo! Tim. Tim's going to take a boat. <laughs> An aircraft carrier. A grocery store. Anybody else? AK-47. <laughs> if Gilligan's there, I'm afraid for Gilligan. <laughs> Tom Hanks. Okay. I might, I might have created a monster here. So if you think about this question, we've heard quite a variety of answers. By the way, first service we heard such things as my wife. Um, Tim Sheffy's going to be in really good shape come Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> we, we also heard hunting knife. And several people said drinking water. Uh, if, you, if you think about this question in general, there's basically two ways I think that people seem to answer this question of one item. Either they answer this, the thing that they want with them, the thing that they would take with them, the thing that they want is something that has some kind of nostalgic or sentimental uh, kind of, of connection to them, family for instance, or uh, items tend to be a little more on the practical or the essential side. The, the gun, the knife, the water, the boat, uh, that type of thing. So think about it for yourself, you know, if you're answering this question for real, if this does become a matter of life and death somehow, you know, how do you answer for that question is it a qu is, is it that you, you you seek the nostalgic or or, or or the practical or do you you want the sentimental over the essential how you answer that question kind of says something about yourself and it's an interesting question to reflect upon well speaking of reflection and thinking about reflecting on these kind of questions we we have a text today that is a very familiar text um, only Jesus isn't asking question in our text today Jesus rather is making a statement actually is a big long statement a pretty deep and profound statement a statement in some ways that it's a little bit puzzling and certainly some of the people who heard what Jesus had to say were maybe a bit alarmed by what he was saying but I think deep down what Jesus is is trying is trying to do with the statement that he makes in our scripture I'll share that in just a minute is is he wants to he wants to open up the people who are hearing what he has to say, maybe to a, a new way of thinking about what is essential. I think he wants them to have a new way of thinking, a new way of understanding what is truly essential. He wants them to have a different perspective on what 
the most needed circumstance is that they, they likely haven't even considered. Likely they haven't considered this. And I want you to have that frame of reference in mind as we begin to hear this word from the Lord today. Now, we may not get challenged in quite the same way that those first hearers do, but then again, if we read God's word as God's word, and as Jesus speaking to us, I think that we possibly can be challenged as directly as those first listeners were. And, and I, I really want you to kind of have that, that feeling, that perspective here, because I'll tell you, I'm pretty sure as I read through this, and I've spent some time this week, a lot of those people, when they heard what Jesus had to say, and we get into this, they felt like they'd been smacked upside the head with what he had to say. And that might sound weird, but that's not always a bad thing for us to get a little smack from God to make us pay attention. So I want, I, I, want to, I want you to have that in mind here as we begin to look at this text. Now the text this morning, you see in your bulletin, is John chapter 6, verse 35, okay? We're starting today, and for the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at the I Am statements of Jesus. Today, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, and there's I'm the light, and the gate, and the shed, all those we should do a little pop quiz and see if you know all seven. We won't do that right now. Now, the verse is John 6.35, but I'm, I'm going to actually I'm gonna actually give a little context. I'm going to read a little bit bigger portion here. So I really encourage you to open up your Bibles and keep your Bibles open. And you can follow along. If you didn't bring your Bible today, you don't want to get it messed up in the snow, grab a pew Bible. Uh, <laughs> I want you to open up your Bibles and follow along here. And, and we're going to lead up to that, lead up to that uh, verse. 635. I'm going to begin reading actually at verse 25. John chapter 6, verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Just time out here for a second. Notice the, the folks there asking Jesus a question, um, when did you get here? <laughs> Jesus doesn't answer that question, does he? He doesn't answer that question. He launches right into what's on his mind and his heart, and he wants them to see. And this is what I want us to see and to be thinking about. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Take a moment, underline that in your Bible. Put a highlighter on that one. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, our text today, I said, is, is John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. But to really get it, to really get it, we need some context. Now, where I started this morning in verse 25, John 6, 25, really picks up the day after Jesus fed the 5,000. So in your, in your mind, and you're thinking about the things that Jesus did, this encounter here, this teaching, this, this all-out, uh, really big 
hairy, profound thing that Jesus is going to unveil happens the morning, the day after Jesus fed the 5,000. If you think about Jesus feeding the 5,000, we have this beautiful scene, all the people stretched out in front of Jesus, and the scripture says it's 5,000 plus women and children, so it could have been 10, 15, 20,000 people. You think of this vast multitude of people, and Jesus has fed them all. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful image. But what comes next after that is that the folks there get, get an idea and Jesus basically has to give them the slip. After he performs this wondrous thing and cares for them all, compassionately feeds them all, uh, it, 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 he basically has to give them the slip because verse 15, going back in the chapter, says they were ready to take him by force and make him king. The people Jesus had fed were ready to take him by force and make him king. i like you just to sit with that for imagine. That's one maybe to spend some time meditating on. The idea that somehow people could take Jesus by force. I might have to do a series on that someday because I don't think we could finish it all up in one day. The ways that we try to take Jesus by force today, personally and in our society. The people tried to take him by force or wanted to take him by force to make him king, but Jesus knew what was up. He is God. He knew what was up, and so he gives him the slip. And so later that night, he sends the disciples across the lake, and he goes off to pray. And in the middle of the night, then we have where Jesus comes walking across the water, and the disciples are there in the midst of the in the midst of the lake and it's a big storm and they're terrified Jesus hops in the boat things calm down they get where they're going Whew, it's the next day <clears throat> so that's 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 everything that leads up to now the folks that Jesus had fed they're wondering what happened which way did he go <laughs> and finally finally they catch up and find him where he is in the synagogue in Capernaum this is when then they are asking him, where'd you go where'd you go what happened they're looking for him because they want something. But according to Jesus in verse 26 that we read today, they went, or they, they want him for the wrong reason. They want him for the wrong reason. There's probably another sermon in there. What are the right reasons for wanting Jesus? They want him because he filled their bellies. That's it. They want him because he filled their bellies. They should want him for the sign that he performed that shows him to be something more, much more than an ordinary person, much more than even an ordinary teacher or rabbi. In verse 27, Jesus tells them, be less concerned about the perishable things and more concerned with eternal life that I, the Son of Man, can give you. The trouble is, they've been filled here. They've been filled here. Jesus wants them to be filled here. The belly. To the heart. Toward that end, what he is sharing with them, what he's revealing, what he's talking about then, is that they must be fed by God. Kind of like, they brought it up, kind of like the Israelites were with Moses when they wandered the desert for 40 years, only in a deeper way. When Moses led the Israelites and God fed the Israelites for 40 years, they literally had their, their bellies filled. Now they need, their, they, they need to be filled by, by God as God cared for the, the people of Israel every single day. And without him, they wouldn't have survived. But they need to be fed in a much deeper way than just physically. Somehow they need to be fed with, or is it by Jesus himself? And Jesus is offering on God the Father's behalf. It says in verse 32, and now he, God, offers you the truth bread from heaven so you need this and guess what God's gonna provide it verse 33 says the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world and here's that verse that I had you underline and, and, and sticks out sir they said give us that bread every day of our lives Jesus replies then I am the bread of life. Our verse for today. That revelation of Jesus, who he is by he himself. I, I want you I want you to sit with that for a moment. Jesus is the bread of life. 
consider. You, you, you have to see, I hope and pray you see, it means much more, far more than what we think of when we simply think of bread. Jesus is the bread. What Jesus is saying, his purpose as bread is to satisfy his purpose as bread is to sustain all who will receive him and to, to satisfy them, to sustain them in a far deeper way than any ordinary loaf of bread ever could to the most starving person. He is, he is, he is bound and his purpose is to satisfy and to sustain, sustain even more than the finest bread that you could ever imagine when you are the most famished that you could be. I want you to take a moment here, close your eyes, and think of the best piece of bread that you ever ate. And, and it just tasted so extraordinary. Maybe it was at some little cafe in some special place, or maybe it was with someone special. Maybe your memory takes you back to mom's or to grandma's kitchen and the smell of fresh bread rising and, and cooking in the oven. Jesus sustains, Jesus satisfies in a way that the best bread in the world that you could ever imagine ever could. What Jesus is implying and what we should get here is that the very essence of what we need to live is Jesus himself. Let me say that again. The very essence of what we need to live is Jesus himself. Without Jesus, no matter what our life might look like to an outsider, it is not full or it is not complete. In fact, the exact opposite probably is, whether we know it or not, if we don't have Jesus. If we don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter how good it looks, how shiny and new and glamorous it looks. If it doesn't have Jesus, it's not full. It's not complete. I want you to consider for a moment. We could think about ourselves and we could think about friends or neighbors, but let's, let's take the easy road here. You know, you're walking through the grocery store and you got all your stuff and you come up to the checkout line and there's all those rags there with whatever is happening in Hollywood, you know, aliens and blah, 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 and who's divorcing who and who just bought some crazy house and who just balloon dieted or whatever. You think about Hollywood and our entertainment scene today. In the, in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of our culture, these are some of the people who, who have it all, who have the most. You know, they live glamorous lives. Um, if they want to say something at all, you know, 17 different news outlets are going to pay attention no matter if they know what they're talking about or not, right? These are people who, who seem to live in just fabulous houses, and, 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 and it's not just one. We got one here and one there and one there and one there, you know. Where do you want your dream house to be? They don't settle for one. They've got six. These are people there that seem to have everything, and yet what we see time and time again is that even amongst those where it seems like they have so much and everything you could possibly want. Oftentimes there's so much brokenness, right? What, what we hear again and again and again are about failed marriages and failed relationships. And we, we hear about the, the destructive behavior, about the stints in rehab and the drug use. And we hear about the alcohol problems. And ultimately we find out that all too common are things like depression and suicide, even among these people who seem to have everything you could possibly want. Now I say to you, these are some extreme cases, but... That's often what it takes to really catch our attention. And if we think a little too close to home, well, sometimes it gets a little too close to home. But you've all probably got a friend or two or know someone or know a neighbor. Maybe it's you yourself. Outwardly, it looks like everything's fine. Everything's all together. Everything's even good. But inwardly, there's a whole lot of brokenness. There's a whole lot of unhealthiness. And what it comes down to so many times is this person that seems to have it all the thing they're lacking is faith. They're lacking Christ. And so outwardly, they're looking great. But inwardly, something huge is missing. So much of our society today, I think, is, is really sick. It's really sick. It just doesn't realize it because everybody's sick in the same way. Sick seems to be normal. 
everybody's in the same shape. But how can our society, and right here, right now, how can we ourselves be whole, be blessed, be complete, unless we are sustained by Christ, unless we truly depend on Him, unless He is the source of our strength and our being? That Jesus calls himself bread, that source of strength, of sustenance. That Jesus calls himself bread should evoke for us images. Images in the Old Testament of the show bread or the, or the bread offering that was offered in the temple every single day. It was part of the ritual of worship. It was part of the thing that connected people with, with God. It should remind us of God feeding the Israelites as we have in the text today. It should remind us of God feeding the Israelites for 40 years, day in, day out. If you're not familiar, you know, Rich Mullins has a really cute song there about manna. 40 years wandering in the desert. Manna bread, manna pizza, manna burgers, manna, 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 manna. Every day, manna. Every day, manna. What? Keith Green. Well, that's close. <laughs> they both died. Sorry. <laughs> Keith Green, manna. Um, it should remind us of that is every day they would not have survived without what God provided. That Jesus calls himself bread should remind us of, again of, God, of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000. And remember, it says women and children also. So that 5 and 4 could have been 10, 15, 20. It could have been 12 or 16,000. But why do we even have have two different stories here. Did Jesus feed the 5,000 and he forgot a few? They didn't have their reservations in in time? No. If you look closely at scripture and you understand what's going on, when Jesus fed the 5,000, it was in Israel. You look on the map and it was in Israel, in the, the chosen land for the chosen people. When he fed the 4,000, it was across the Jordan River, which means what? It was on the wrong side of the tracks. And symbolically, you have here that Jesus is feeding the chosen and Jesus is feeding everyone. What we have between these two is that Jesus feeds everybody. When we think about Jesus calling himself bread, most of all, it should remind us of Jesus sharing the special Passover that we call the Lord's Supper with the disciples, where he says, the bread, this bread is in my body. He foreshadows that, actually, in John 6. If we read a little bit further, if you read a little bit further in the chapter here, let me share this with you here. Beginning in verse 47, Jesus actually foreshadows that teaching that will come later in the upper room with the Passover, with the Lord's Supper. Beginning at verse 47, I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. <clears throat> I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in me. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. What does that mean? Gruesome stuff in one regard. This is where I said it probably really disturbed people when they, some of them heard this. What does it mean? What it means is this. We, you and I, must fill ourselves with Jesus completely. And though that probably didn't quite register really with the crowd, they really didn't understand, we, we can see that for sure later on, we should take a cue at their initial response to Jesus saying that he is the bread. To go back to that verse 34 I had you underlined, where they say, give us that bread every day of our lives. This is what we need. To be filled every day, we need that bread every day. And I ask you, is that your desire? Can you pray that prayer? Can you say what they said? Can you pray what they said? Lord, give us that bread. Really? Every day. Can you do that every day? 
Some people are, well, yeah, I can, but then the everyday part gets a little bit fuzzy because they get busy, right? You got lists and to-dos and to-don'ts and... But don't you eat to sustain your body every day? How many of you here eat every day? Just curious. Every day? Maybe some eat two meals and some eat seven. You know, we might have some hobbits out there, but we eat every day to sustain our bodies. Isn't it reasonable that you must sustain your spirit every day? I want you to take a moment. I'm not going to ask you what it is, so don't be disturbed. Think really. I want you to think of, I want you to think of the greatest thing that ever happened to you. The greatest thing that ever happened to you in your life. Some of you, that might have been last week. Some of you, that might have been decades ago. It might be the day you got married. It might be the day that she said yes. It might be the day that a child or a grandchild was, whatever it was. Uh, you, you won the championship. You graduated. You passed the test. Think of the thing that right now is the greatest thing that ever happened to you in your life. And I want you to picture that in your mind. Can you, can you picture it? And can you feel a little bit what you were feeling when that happened I would submit that, that if you've got something in your mind and you hold it in your mind you can close your eyes and you can picture it and you can remember details that you could describe it but you aren't going to be able to feel it the way that you felt it when you first felt it for me maybe one of the greatest things that ever happened June 27th 1992 11 o'clock in the morning Peach Bottom United Methodist Church Bonnie said, I do, to me. And I remember that service. I remember walking out of that service, little country church, filled to the gills, hotter than blazes because there was no air conditioning, dressed in the monkey suit, walking out of there, and it was probably three different shades from the sweat that I felt, but just absolutely elated that my feet barely touched the ground. And the first people that came out the door then that I remember seeing were my parents, and I just like melted into my dad's arms, just overwhelmed with emotion and joy and excited. And like, finally, <laughs> we were engaged for a really long time. <laughs> I was so elated and so full of joy. I, I know that here, and I can picture it, and I can tell you about it, but I can't feel it the same way that I felt it that very first time. Because no matter how strong that memory is, that moment was for you, if you think back, well, feelings, even intense feelings, they start to fade, they start to wane, and that happens, if you're honest, pretty quick. Married. Yay! And the next day, married. And then a week later, this is my new wife. And you, you know what I'm saying here? It just, you can't sustain, or you don't sustain that same kind of intensity of feeling over time. A day, a week, a month, maybe decades later, it's just different. It's just different. Why is that? It, but I'll submit to you, the same thing is true if you apply this principle to our faith. What do we say when we see someone who has just come to the Lord and who's really excited? How do we describe them? I heard it. Starts with an F. Boy, so-and-so's on fire for the Lord. Look at them. And we just talk about how they are, they are blazing. How long does that last? Uh, till, till like reality sets in and they start to understand? Is that, is that how long it lasts? No, there are people who really understand what it means to follow Christ and they're still on fire. How long that on fire thing lasts has less to do with understanding than it does really with whether or not they keep feeding their faith adequately. Years ago, when Bonnie and I were first married, every year we would go to a family reunion down in Virginia. It was a long camp out. This was a farm where her grandmother grew up, and they had turned it into a little family campground. And built into the side of the hill, there's this giant outdoor fire. This was formed kind of an open U shape, and these giant, monstrous, heavy iron stone rocks would take three, three people to lift, or maybe Josh on a good day. And, and it just, you know, it was, it was a monstrous thing. It was the focal point every day. The fire usually burned all day. And when evening came, people start pulling their chairs up around to tell stories. You know, if you've been to family reunions, it's kind of the same story every day. Or, you know, 
pulling up their chairs, talking, visiting, and, and someone started to throw a little wood on the fire. And somebody else would come along and throw a little something else on the fire. You know what happened. After a while, that fire, it could be literally 10, 12 feet tall. It's throwing sparks up into the air. It looked like a shuttle was going off. Just enormous. And we would keep it burning, just watching, just mesmerized, as you so often are, at this site. But as the hours would creep on, eventually you stop throwing the extra piece of wood on the fire. And over time, it starts to kind of do this until it dwindled and dwindled down. Why? Because it stopped feeding. It was still burning, but it was burning a whole lot lower. I would submit to you that there are a whole lot of Christians, and if you're feeling like this, there's always confession. A whole lot of Christians everywhere, they're still burning. They're still burning from that first time that Christ lit them up. But truthfully, it's a lot lower than it was. A lot lower than it was. I think there are many believers, and sometimes we all probably go through this, seems like they're, they're dieting spiritually, restricting their calories, if you will, rather than feeding and being fed, being filled up. What they need, that fire needs wood, the Christian needs fed, needs filled up. And the only thing that will truly fill you up and sustain you is what you receive from the bread of life, the one who is our source of life. They need filled up again and again and again with Christ. Why do you need filled up again and again? Because life saps you. No, you're not a fire, you're not a piece of wood, but life saps you. Some days of work are okay, right? Some days are great. Some days are horrible. On those horrible days, where does your energy go? Boom. And if your energy's doing that, your spirit's doing that as well. Sometimes for some people, the thing that saps them and zaps their energy and their strength and their spirit is family. It's sorry to say, but sometimes it's family that saps us. Sometimes it's school. Sometimes it's the doctor is telling you something about you or a friend. There's so many things that sap us and zap us that take our energy, that draw down our spirit, that leave us feeling depleted. So we need to get filled up again and again. But here's the good news. Jesus is the bread of life. And if you believe in him and you receive him, your life will be renewed. We find out when we receive him, there is nothing more necessary in our lives than him. You ask anybody who's been through a real tough health scare and how they got through. God got me through. I want to close this way, thinking about Jesus' bread. After this long teaching that we're looking at here in chapter 6, we're really kind of looking at the whole chapter 6. In verse 66, there, it says a lot of the disciples heard everything Jesus had to say. And, 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 and they, they turned away. They're deserting him because it's too hard. Jesus asked the 12, are you going to leave too? Simon Peter, Simon, good old foot in the mouth Simon, got something right here. He says, Lord, to whom would we go? You alone have the words that give eternal life. We believe them and we know that you are the Holy One of God. How about you? Is Jesus the Holy One of God? The very bread or essence that we need every day for life itself? Or is that too hard? Those who believe and who fill themselves and allow themselves to be filled will never be hungry again. God will raise them up. But those who don't believe have no life. They're just too broken, too sick, or too blind to see it. So here at the end, forget the desert island. Forget Gilligan. You're stuck in life. You're here, right? You're living it. You're stuck in life. And you can only have one thing. What do you want? Amen.